So Anthropic has several competitors. It'd be interesting to get your sort of view of it all. OpenAI, Google, XAI, Meta. What does it take to win in the broad sense of win in the space? Yeah, so I want to separate out a couple things, right? So, you know, Anthropic's, Anthropic's mission is to kind of try to make this all go well, right? And, and, you know, we have a theory of change called race to the top, right? Race to the top is about trying to push the other players to do the right thing by setting an example. It's not about being the good guy. It's about setting things up so that all of us can be the good guy. I'll give a few examples of this. Early in the history of Anthropic, one of our co-founders, Chris Ola, who I believe you're, you're interviewing soon, you know, he's the co-founder of the field of mechanistic interpretability, which is an attempt to understand what's going on inside AI models. Uh, so we had him and one of our early teams focus on this area of interpretability, which we think is good for making models safe and transparent. For three or four years, that had no commercial application whatsoever. It still doesn't today. We're doing some early betas with it, and probably it will eventually. But, uh, you know, this is a very, very long research bed and one in which we've, we've built in public and shared our results publicly. And, and we did this because, you know, we think it's a way to make models safer. An interesting thing is that as we've done this, other companies have started doing it as well. In some cases, because they've been inspired by it. In some cases, because they're worried that, uh, you know, if if other companies are doing this, that look more responsible, they want to look more responsible too. No one wants to look like the irresponsible actor. And, and so they adopt this they adopt this as well. When folks come to Anthropic, interpretability is often a draw. And I tell them, the other places you didn't go, tell them why you came here. Um, and, and then y y you see soon that, there, that there's interpretability teams else, elsewhere as well. And in a way, that takes away our competitive advantage because it's like, oh, they, they, now others are doing it as well, but it's good, it's good for the broader system. And so we have to invent some new thing that we're doing that others aren't doing as well. And the hope is to basically bid up, bid up the importance of 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 doing the right thing. And it's not it's not about us in particular, right? It's not about having one particular good guy. Other companies can do this as well. If they if they if they join the race to do this, that's that's you know that's the best news ever, right? Um, uh, it's it's just it's about kind of shaping the incentives to point upward instead of shaping the incentives to point to point downward. And we should say this example of the field of uh, mechanistic interpretability is just a, a rigorous, non-hand-wavy way of doing AI safety. Yes. Or it's tending that way. Trying to. I mean, I, I think we're still early um, in terms of our ability to see things, but I've been surprised at how much we've been able to look inside these systems and understand what we see, right? Unlike with the scaling laws where it feels like there's some you know, law that's driving these models to perform better, on, on the inside, the models aren't, you know, there's no reason why they should be designed for us to understand them, right? They're designed to operate. They're designed to work, just like the human brain or human biochemistry. They're not designed for a human to open up the hatch, look inside, and understand them. But we have found, and, you know, you can talk in much more detail about this to Chris, that when we open them up, when we do look inside them, we, we find things that are surprisingly interesting. And as a side effect, you also get to see the beauty of these models. It, you get to explore the sort of uh, the beautiful na nature of large neural networks through the mechanterp kind of I'm, methodology. I'm amazed at how clean it's been. Yeah. I, I'm amazed <laughs> at things like induction heads. I'm amazed at things like, uh, you know, that that we can, you know, use sparse autoencoders to find these directions within the networks uh, and that the directions correspond to these very clear concepts. We demonstrated this a bit with the Golden Gate Bridge Claud. So this was an experiment where we found a, a direction inside one of the, the neural network's layers that corresponded to the Golden Gate Bridge. And we just turned that way up. And so we, we released this model as a demo. It was kind of half a joke uh, for a couple days, uh, but it was, it was illustrative of, of the method we developed. And... Uh, you could you could take the Golden Gate. Uh, you could take the model. You could ask it about anything. You know, you know, it would be like how you, you could say how was your day, and anything you asked because this feature was activated it would connect to the Golden Gate Bridge. So it would say, you know, I'm 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 feeling relaxed and expansive, much like the arches of the <laughs> yeah. Golden Gate Bridge, or you know, it would masterfully change topic yes. to the Golden Gate Bridge and integrate it. There was also a sadness to it, to to the focus it had on the Golden Gate Bridge. I think people quickly fell in love with it. I think so people already miss it 
because it was taken down, I think, after a day. Somehow these interventions on the model um, where, 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 where you kind of adjust its behavior somehow emotionally made it seem more human yeah. than any other version of the it model. A strong personality, strong um, it identity. It has a strong personality. It has these kind of like obsessive interests. You know, we can all think of someone who's like yeah. obsessed with something. Yeah. So it does make it feel somehow a bit more human.